Okay. Um, so I think we're going to go ahead and start. Um, hi, my name is David, and I'm a publisher. Um, the first step to solving a problem is admitting you have a problem, and I, well, the publishers in this room, we have a problem. Um, we think what we do is important, um, but we have a really hard time just explaining the value that we add. Um, we've been continuously attacked by often very angry advocates for various causes for many years now, so much so um, that most of us have been completely frightened away um, from even the vaguest notion of sticking our heads up above the trenches and, God forbid, drawing any attention to ourselves. Um, flying beneath the radar does have some advantages as a strategy. It lets others take the heat instead of you. Um, but it also comes with some powerful disadvantages as it lets others control the conversation and define who you are. Um, we're at a societal inflection point, uh, and, and in many ways, this has provided us with a perfect opportunity for us to tell our story. Um, we're inundated with propaganda and marketing masquerading as fact. Um, and now more than ever, the, the value of careful curation and editorial oversight is being recognized um, as vital to a healthy society. Um, so if you've been looking for a simple and foolproof um, narrative to explain just what it is we do and why it's important, this is your chance. And I urge all to sort of come out of hiding and let your voice be heard. Um, we're also at an era of increased regulation around publication, the publication activity of researchers. Um, a, a recent poll, however, showed that more than half of the researchers polled did not know their own funders' policies. Um, we're asking researchers to do more. We're instituting complex policies around the reuse of different versions of papers at different times. Um, and and we, um, we're asking publish or, or researchers to make these critical decisions around things like copyright. Um, as publishers, we spend all of our time immersed in these issues, um, so much so that they become like the air that we breathe. And we assume that everyone else understands them just as we do. Uh, but publishing is, is at best a peripheral activity for researchers, uh, something that takes them away from their real work of actually doing research. Um, so there are a lot of questions around what can we do to help drive better awareness of the things that we think researchers need to know. Uh, we have three speakers today and then hopefully a, a lively discussion. Um, uh, Tom Reller, uh, the man with the hardest job in scholarly publishing, uh, will start us off with, his, uh, with a talk about his experiences in speaking directly with the research community and why you might want to consider doing the same. Um, next up, uh, Philippa Benson will talk about uh, transparency and um, can we be more open and clear about our activities. Um, and then finally, Karen Wolf will uh, talk about um, efforts to reach out directly to researchers and to educate them on the basics of publishing and the issues that are having a direct impact on their work. So I will turn things uh, over to Tom. All right. Uh, Great. Find your slides. We'll try to set it up. I guess while I'm setting this up, I was thinking that uh, as a speaker trainer, I always tell my speakers to um, Never script yourself. That's, no, that's not mine, David. Um, I always be quite natural, and then I go off, and then I script myself for these speaking presentations. Uh, but, uh, OK, slideshow, let's start. All right, cool. And so again, the header of this presentation is, uh, is about being serious, but, uh, but not too serious about engaging in, uh, in media and social media. So, you know, good afternoon. Just like it started from with high script. So again, I'm Tom Reller, head of corporate relations and the company spokesman for Elsevier. Uh, no, I am not quite the Sean Spicer of, uh, of Elsevier in that I'm never asked to, to, to either lie or defend things that are, that are too crazy. Um, <laughs> but, you know, those can be my facial expressions during, uh, any, you know, during the course of any particular day. Uh, but to be honest, actually, I'm really more like this most, uh, most of the time. And you know, before I get too far into this, let me uh, remind Sean Spicer and, and other colleagues that are going to be mentioned throughout this presentation uh, that if they don't like what I have to say, remember, it's not me. It's the fake me that actually said it. Um, so I thought for today I'd offer some observations and ideas I've, I've gathered from being at the, the front lines uh, of a number of debates that have been taking place in our industry since I started this position a little over 10 years ago. 
And yes, I have been the front man for Elsevier that long, and I am still here to talk about it. Um, and when I come to conferences like this, people ask me all the time, you know, how do I do it? Well, for one, I have the privilege of knowing that Elsevier is a great company, and that all of us within SSP, both the, the profits and the nonprofits, are doing the right thing to help science and society. Sure, we can all do some things that upset some customers from time to time. Nobody gets that joke? Chris gets it, okay. <laughs> but I thought more people were going to get that joke. You may have to explain. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, but the underlying premise that for science to truly benefit society, it needs commercially oriented, financially strong partners to help attract investment and drive innovation. It's what keeps me and thousands of others going strong even when Twitter is blowing up. It also helps that scientists themselves believe that we help them achieve their objectives, or else more of them wouldn't keep turning to us in the numbers that they do. Uh, and I also have help. I mean, by, by no means do I represent Elsevier alone. For example, I know a lot of you are familiar with, uh, with Mr. Gunn and with uh, Alicia Wise. And, uh, okay, more people got that, so that was okay. Alicia proved that, by the way. Just, uh, she has a sense of humor, too. So, so one of my top observations over the years is that the industry seems content to let Elsevier take the lead in the press and in social media on most of the important issues of the day. Okay, sure, uh, the issues may be of our causing sometimes, again, our friend, um, but you know, not all of the time. But I'm not aware of another organization in this sector that has someone like me. Think in terms of proactively speaking to media and working with colleagues on how to explain the things that we're doing as a company. And think about that for a second. An industry of hundreds of professional organizations, and almost none of them have a head of media relations. And I don't mean some of the issues press releases, I mean career professionals who are responsible for shaping a perspective on publicly debated topics and pro proactively taking that message out to media and through social media. I'm well aware that each individual organization has its own reasons for not having these positions. But collectively, the result is that not enough people in our industry are working to shape public opinion. Now, publishers are all great at talking to authors, and to many, th that may be enough. But the, the Economist writes another article that gets all sorts of facts wrong, that millions of taxpayers read, and we're all annoyed by how the reporter covered us. Sure, reporters make mistakes all the time, but it's not their fault when more of the companies that they're trying to cover won't talk to them. I think this is an industry-wide issue, but the industry organizations haven't really done enough. To illustrate, we're, we're here at SSP, which is a fantastic member-driven organization with a really healthy committee system. In fact, there are 25 committees, but none of them are a PR or media relations committee. The American Association of Publishers dissolved its industry PR committee after the Research Works Act when you could have argued it needed it the most. The STM Association has a PR committee, but it has very few members, and we can't find anyone to lead it. The, the shame is that there actually are a lot of really cool things for SSP members to be talking about. We can be talking more about data, artificial intelligence, ethics, and how our workforces are adapting to meet those needs. The shift from print to electronic is actually old news by now. We can all be talking a lot more about what's next. Now, there is effort entailed in doing that, and I think more organizations should decide it's worth that effort if we don't want to be seen as beholden to the past. Now, don't get me wrong, I, you know, I kind of like being the only uh, head of PR in an industry. Uh, in some ways, I'm your spokesperson too. In fact, I have conversations with reporters about all of you all of the time. <laughs> I can see looks of fear almost, <laughs> you know, I should get a picture of all your faces right now. But to be honest with you, I'm not so sure it's good for the industry that I'm your spokesman or that I'm the only one that's talking to reporters about you. Let's look at it this way. Media relations is about storytelling, and good storytelling is often contingent upon having a sympathetic character deliver your message. Let's look at two other sympathetic characters that have also been talking to reporters about you in recent years, Alexander Elbeckian and Jack Andraka. So, so here are three people that are talking to reporters and are engaging on social media on your behalf. And I mean, it's not really a fair fight. He hangs out with Bill Clinton. She hangs out with Robin Hood. 
and, and I hang out with these guys. Now, what the, scholarly, what the SSP does have is the scholarly kitchen, and it's great. I learned a tremendous amount from, this, from the kitchen. I, can I can't tell you how many times I've directed reporters to, to specific, specific, <laughs> specific posts on it to learn more. But my two observations on the kitchen are that first, for the most part, it's really just the industry talking to itself. And it's not really even the industry. It's about, what, five or six chefs and a handful of the same commenters. They're all really smart people. They're all really helpful. But they're not engaging enough uh, others. So I've long had this saying that the chefs need to get out of the kitchen. They need to take their plates and get out on the road. You know, like John, uh, John Favreau in that movie, Chef. So this is kind of what the scholarly kitchen needs to do. And, and this is how it would look. I, I, can, you know, I, I can see how much fun the chefs are having serving the public. And, and I can really see this happening. Like, look, there's, there's, there's Roger. There's, there's Phil Jones smiling in the back. There's Angela. And there's David, of course, as the head chef. And, and there's David in the comment thread. <laughs> this is what it would look like if Phil Davis ever got out of the kitchen. And, and, and let's not forget the prior head chef. And there he is in the comment thread. So this all leads me to my second point, which is I think that we could all lighten things up in the kitchen. Uh, it's not altogether inviting, and it's actually pretty intimidating. I was thinking, you know, shouldn't it be more like one of those restaurants in some all-inclusive resor resort in the Caribbean? You know, it's cool, it's friendly, there's no pressure. Now, like, there's a place I'm willing to go to have a conversation. And I'm not saying that we need to hire students or pirates to represent us or that the scholarly kitchen isn't great. But what I am saying is that as an industry, we need to greatly expand the number of people that are talking on our behalf and increase the number of channels by which we send our messages out. We need scale. At Elsevier, we have Elsevier Connect. Wiley has Wiley Exchanges, and other houses have blogs. But even that's not enough. So, so let's look at it this way. Every time something newsworthy happens in our sector that affects both publishers and researchers, this is what a reporter sees on social media from the anti-publisher advocacy community. Anyone want to guess what they see from publishers? <laughs> and that's not even really accurate. It, it really looks more like this. So, so the point is that sometimes more people talking is more important than what it is that they have to say. I think when it comes to communications in this sector, the first priority is to get people talking online, and then let's worry later about what exactly it is that they have to say. More employees need to feel, feel like they can say something without having to wait a week to get what they want to say approved. What I mean is that top management from all our companies need to develop a culture where employees feel more empowered to go online to defend, explain, or champion what it is that they do to help scientists. And think about it, we, you know, we all help scientists for a living. You know, we have the best jobs in the world. But you wouldn't know it from media or, or social media. I mean, we should come across as if we're this happy when we're on social media. Instead, publishers on social media act like we're just hoping not to have our heads chopped off every time a journal increases its impact factor or charges an APC. At Elsevier, sure, we carefully control how some issues are explained. Yes, our business and policy framework is incredibly complex. But we also help employees understand where they should engage and, and where they shouldn't. But more importantly, we're willing to let employees be themselves online. Speaking of which, William, our friend Mr. Gunn, believes so much in being himself, he literally wrote it on his profile that his tweets are not vetted by PR or legal. And that's, that's really what he means, by the way. <laughs> now, do I ever say, you know, hmm, I kind of wish William had asked me or someone else about doing that at first? Sure, but the point is that William does a far lot more good on Twitter, on Twitter than he does harm. I'd even go so far as to say that every organizational member of SSP should have a William Gunn on staff. And if anyone would like to actually have the actual William Gunn on staff, <laughs> please come talk to me after the show. I am sitting right here. <laughs> so all I'm really trying to say is to encourage us all to get more publicly engaged with the issues that are impacting us. Uh, it's a serious issue that we do this, but we don't have to take it so seriously every day. 
And if anyone would like to talk to me more about this on either an individual or organizational level, please let me know. Thanks. Okay, um, so I can start by saying that I am definitely not scripted um, because I had the travel experience from hell yesterday. I'll compare notes with any of you. So I put this from my memory together like at three o'clock this morning. So bear with me. Um, so I am Philippa Benson. I am the managing editor of Science Advances, which is AAAS's open access journal. We call it the expansion of science. Um, but previous to this iteration of my profession, um, I, was, I began my career as an academic, um, doing research on how scientists write um, from a psychological perspective, what they consider when they're constructing and revising text. I've also worked as the director of author services for vendors who help authors with writing tasks, with picking journals, with understanding the publishing process. I'll give you a little overview of where I've done some of that work. And I've led editorial offices in places other than AAAS, at um, NGOs, at small societies, and now at a relatively larger society. And I'm also an author, and I've taught an awful lot. So I have um, spent a lot of time um, with authors and thinking about how they think and feel. Um, so this session is about finding our voices as publishers and how we connect with authors. So we're up here in the scholarly kitchen. We're up here at the top, at the top of the ranks. And our question is, can you hear me? Why don't we have, when I met with David and Tom, they were like, why aren't more people participating in the scholarly kitchen? And that was a good question. So the question we were asking is, how do we address this problem of connecting and communicating with the research community? It's a premise that we have. Why don't people really understand us? And why don't they care to understand us? The question is, how can we make them understand that we are important shining stars in their universe? So one of the things I want to do, and it, forgive me for those of you who have seen my, my little model here in the past, but this is how I think authors see their universe and their communication challenges. So of course it all starts with funding. They've got to get some funding. So let's say it begins. And I'm happy to share this slide with anybody. And when they're conducting their research, their audiences are the people in their institutions who give them the resources that they need to do their work. That's who they communicate with. And at some point, they have to write it up, but they're still doing it in the context of their institution and their colleagues. And when they're getting ready to submit for publication, they start to think about this different audience, who they're going to engage in, and they start to decide who is it, where are they going to publish, and what do they care about that publisher. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about how do you engage there. And then when they get in, they have to go through this dance of revision with the publisher, with the community, of people who are critiquing their work and with their colleagues. And then it gets through and they care about disseminating it through social media, through other um, venues that that publication gets to. And then it goes out and it's debated and changed and they come up with new questions 
and then they apply for more funding to answer the new questions. That's the world, the communication world that authors live in. And it's all relatively evenly distributed at each stage. I tend to think that they're doing this when someone is at this stage in pursuit of tenure and promotion. They're going through this. Yes, they want knowledge. Yes, they want to find new information. They want to make the world a better place or push forward the boundaries of the human experience. But they're also, at the end of the day, they want tenure and promotion. They want a job in their hands. Would you agree? Now, the publisher's view, you can see there's a, a few things different here. One is that publishers think about publishers a lot. Would you agree? Absolutely. And when I got up here, I just felt like saying ditto to what Tom said. You know, that's the end of my presentation, ditto, same thing. A lot of our messages are right on target, and we didn't we didn't plan beforehand. But one of the key differences here in publishers' views of the world is that the core of it is that information must be vetted to be valuable. We try and avoid fake news. That's what the gears of our industry is about. How do we make sure that that which we put forward as knowledge has some resonance of truth to it. That's what all those gears that we do behind the scenes are meant to sort of clean out. So what are some of the things that we can do to help authors understand those gears? So we can try and get to authors when they're students. So you can find for undergraduates and graduates writing courses or courses about scientific expression in language at undergraduate and graduate levels given through English departments. Not so great, maybe, because in part, they're being taught by people who really don't understand the curriculum. Or writing across the curriculum courses, courses that are taught in content courses by scientists, most of whom have very little idea how to teach about writing or publishing. And still, those audiences are students, whether they're undergraduate or graduate. They are a captured audience, but they have no context of real life. They're not in that circle of, that cycle of knowledge production that I talked about before. When you get to talk about authors as professionals, there are a lot of opportunities out there. There are a lot of efforts out there. They're offered by publishers. They're offered by societies, professional societies. They're offered by not-for-profit vendors. And they're done both domestically and internationally, in the US, in Europe, and elsewhere. I think some of the SSP sessions are going to be rebroadcast in other countries. Um, but all of this makes for a cacophony of voices. They're coming from a lot of different places. And they're not always wholly unified messages, and they come at disparate times. So I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of things that I've done in this effort. I published a book, What Editors Want, and it tries to show authors the editor's perspective on why we ask authors to do things that we ask them to do. And we talk about my co-author, uh, Sue Silver, from the Ecological Society of America, and I talk about um, data requirements. We talk about ORCID. We talk about COPE. We talk about all the different things that, as editors, we care about. Now, that book has sold OK, but not great, not a bestseller. 
I've published things. Lots of little articles here and there about what you should and shouldn't do. Got a couple of downloads. I found out I had 18 tweets about it. 18 tweets. That's not a lot of pickup. I've been all over China. I was going to put dots of all the cities I'd been to, and then I realized I'd lost track. So I've been all over China, and I've lectured widely in the United States, little things of how to succeed in publishing. And I've also, this picture on the bottom right is one of the lectures I've given to editors in China who are required by the government to have continuing education on how to keep up and understand and engage with international um, priorities and trends and requirements in STM publishing. Just for giggles, I also thought I'd put this up when I went to North Korea to teach scientists there. It wasn't a particularly receptive audience. A lot of time was spent literally kowtowing, and also I thought I'd share that. I don't know if you can see the little graphic. That was on an orphanage wall. So I was lucky to come in, and I was lucky to get out. <laughs> but, but I was invited. I was invited to go to talk about standards and practices in publishing to North Korean scientists. So there is an appetite there. But what I found out through all my outreach at the end of the day is what people want to know about is what is your impact factor? I want to publish in some place that is a high impact factor. All the things that people complain about is over, largely overridden. You can debate with me on this, but that's been my experience. So authors still really don't know what they don't know. They don't know all the gears behind the things that we do to try and ensure that the information that is published is true new knowledge and has been gathered in ethical, sound ways. So we can educate authors when they're students. We can try and educate authors when they're professionals. And we can try and also educate more young publishing professionals. Now, that is preaching to the choir, but young choirs is how the culture of publishing will change. Now, chatter, all of this talking, doesn't equal change, just like open access isn't free. And that's still something, still that basic idea that open access does not mean that, a, that the information is free, that has no cost. That idea is still misunderstood by authors. So we haven't permeated in with all the chatter, with all the tweets, with all the social media, with all the teaching. We're still not hitting at the right level to get the information across. So my idea is if it's lonely at the top, if we can't hear our voices, we should move to a different place. We should be speaking in different arenas. So I put forward the idea that we should be going to and focusing on our education and our engagement at these different levels and strategizing about how to get more continuous information to people, not when they're right at the stage of getting ready to publish or publishing, but when they're in their labs, when they're doing the work, when they're posing their questions in conferences and other things, when they're not in the midst 
of the publishing activity to get to them at these other points. So I do want to applaud SSP and the 25 committees and more that are being active and activated to try and get these kinds of efforts forward. And like David, like Tom, like our speakers earlier today, I think we should all be more engaged in these committees, but looking at other places where we can get information about the value that we add to authors. And so the question is, can you hear me now if you are in the academy talking to department chairs, talking to deans, talking to provosts, or talking to the people who will fill those seats and who will at some point start to value publications and information and research that has been communicated outside of a journal with a high impact factor. Now, of course, I want my journal, which does not yet have an impact factor, to have a high impact factor, so I'm really talking out the left side of my mouth. But anyway, that's all I have to say, so perhaps we'll find our voices if we speak together and focus more on audiences beyond ourselves. Thank you. Hello, it's very nice to be here. Um, I wanna thank David, first of all, for inviting me to participate in this. Um, I run a research institute focused in early American history, so I'm a little bit of an outlier uh, among scholarly publishers in the sense that uh, I'm a historian, I'm a humanist. Uh, the journal that I publish, we publish independently, not within a university press, which is what most uh, humanities journals do. Um, and we publish a book series, and we run postdoctoral fellowships and dissertation fellowships and conferences and things, but all within this one um, kind of field of early American history, which I'm gonna talk about in, uh, in just a minute. I wanna acknowledge the excellent points made by Tom and Philippa, um, and just say that I'll echo a, a lot of what they have to say, but also, I think, demonstrating a kind of case study of what we've done in my field to try to really reach um, academic researchers in particular where they live. So I find that I'm often uh, talking in two directions at once, to publishers about what humanities scholars want and need, and to my research community about scholarly publishing. No historian would claim that we are living in a uniquely perilous time. Historians are very keen on perspective. But there are specific challenges for both researchers and publishers that are not only clearly important to the future of the knowledge economy at large, but also best addressed through mutual efforts, and that, of course, begins with communication. So uh, let me start with a few caveats. As I said, I come to the challenge of communicating, uh, there we go. I come to the challenge of communicating with research community from a particular perspective. I'm a historian, which is the largest, that is, in terms of publishing, humanities discipline, and I'm an early Americanist, which is a field that pulls a lot of public and political freight as well as having a long and distinguished research and publication tradition. My vantage, though, is important, not only because it explains part of what I'll be talking about today, but also because each of us, each discipline, each field and publishing stakeholder, comes from a professional culture with expectations and knowledge. And we all need to be really self-conscious about the particularity of our position. There is more and better attention, although I would argue much too little attention to the ways that STEM and HSS disciplines have very distinctive research processes and outputs. And within that binary, there are plenty of differences with implications for scholars and publishers. For example, I think we know that most STEM disciplines are journal-based and most humanities disciplines are book disciplines, but there are key differences even within those. For example, in terms of historians versus literary scholars or anthropologists, 
how we organize, fund, and undertake our research, and then how we share our results are really quite different and distinct and have to be served by publishers in different ways. We're also all generally aware that HSS is differently positioned within scholarly publishing, a much smaller share of the total than STEM. Much less money is on the table for every piece of the stakeholder pie that Philippa illustrated. And for the most part, big issues such as open access have been STEM driven and HSS resisted. I think it's a kind of relevant aside here to say that HSS resistance is mostly a matter of those differences in research process funding and outputs and not at all a resistance to access. Our longtime strategy for accessibility was simply to be incredibly cheap, to keep costs really low and intensive editorial costs covered by means other than direct revenues. But that model won't work. Whoa, sorry. But that model won't work if you still need that little bit of revenue, that direct revenue, to make even that cheap system go. As one of the Hefke officials said to me in the UK when we were talking about the impact of open access requirements in the UK on the considerable number of researchers in my field there, it's not my problem that your publications are as cheap as chips. You should have been charging more all along. History also has a distinctive set of public-facing work. I won't dive into how science and the humanities have different but perhaps converging issues around the authority of expertise, though I think that's really quite important. But for scholarly research and publication, it is important to note that my research community has long wrestled with how to engage the public. There aren't a lot of politicians and media figures who take up biochemistry as a hobby and expect to publish. But history attracts an intense following and a dense set of citizen practitioners. Just this week, a recently departed Fox News host promised that his new book would finally offer readers a look at the American Revolution, top to bottom. Finally, someone's going to talk about that. This is, in one way, a terrific problem to have. People care a lot about history, and they care a lot about aspects of early American history, in some ways right now, actually. But it's also sometimes, frankly, just a problem. And spoiler alerts, the United States was not founded as a Christian nation. There was no easy consensus about the Constitution among the founders such that you can retrieve and apply it. Sorry, originalism. And you can't find an aspect of early America that isn't deeply enmeshed in settler colonialism and slavery. What this means in practical terms is that this research community is often thinking about communicating with specialists and with a popular audience. Communicating with other specialists in specialist publications is vital, and there is little dispute about that. Historical work is not just about reading and reporting on a large set of documents. Honest, there's a lot more method to that identification of materials. Method <clears throat> for reading them, often not all texts for one thing, and digestion of a huge previous literature. But the relationship of history to democracy, informed citizens are necessary to democratic governance, means we also work hard to stay engaged with the public. So what does this have to do with our main task today, thinking about communicating with researchers about publishing? It's about really knowing the field cultures, what researchers are contending with in particular. Last year, Alice Meadows and I wrote a pair of posts for the Scholarly Kitchen. Kent and Phil and David are not the only people who write for the kitchen. Occasionally, some others of us do, and we write about other things. I'll send you some links. <laughs> Alice and I wrote a pair of posts for the Scholarly Kitchen on essentials that researchers and publishers need to grasp when dealing with one another. And we took what we thought were a fairly complex and interconnected set of issues and boiled them down to these seven. The ecosystem, what Rick calls the most overused metaphor in scholarly publishing, but it's still relevant, I say. That is, there is one. There is an ecosystem. And each individual and organization has a place within it. Hygienic practices i.g. not fouling the ecosystem. Business models, what are they? How do they work? Peer review as both ethic and practice. Metrics, how they're generated and used. Tools, that is for discovery or for meeting individual researcher needs and licensing basics. And a premise of those posts was that researchers need to know more about publishing, but also that publishers really need to know a lot more about researchers in order to best meet their needs. This is a point that Philippa made, I think, quite eloquently. And I'm extending that point here to note that it really is essential in communicating about publishing to researchers that we understand how they do their work, under what circumstances they're laboring, and what values they hold. And there are some excellent examples of this 
kind of approach already at this conference. Yesterday's keynote by Paula Steven talked about biomed and physical science postdocs, for example, and the volume and nature of research labor they're performing, the kinds of perverse incentives that are driving publishing and then in turn driving the narrowing of research questions, I think is something we can all be deeply concerned about. David talked this morning, I think that's you talking this morning, about the gazillion things we're now asking researchers to do when they publish. This is a screenshot from Twitter of that earlier session, which I think is pretty meta here. Talk about communicating. I've already previewed for you here a little bit about the field I work in, and that background is really key to be able, being able to communicate with that group about publishing. And now I'm now going to narrow my focus really a lot farther to talk about some of the initiatives we've undertaken within that specific field, early American studies, to communicate about scholarly publishing and mostly within the academy. There are graduate trained historians who do all kinds of things all over the place, but the particular demands of scholarly publishing and the push-pull of scholarly publishing and trying to reach that public audience are particularly acute for that pop population. So it's really key to these efforts to avoid the traditional methods of sharing information. Most academic historians understand publishing from two vantages, as readers, sometimes as the consumer, that is rarely as the person who expends the money, but the person who's really just reading the material, and as producers. And it's easy to think that you have the whole system in mind and you understand it all when you do two, those two things and to have strong opinions about how your experience as a reader and an author should be better in X number of ways and how you could fix the whole system without understanding um, other pieces and places within it. But given the ways that academics consume information it is, that is, isn't really in their immediate uh, stream of need. It's a challenge to find ways to communicate how this whole system works and why it really is to their benefit to understand it. There's simply too much coming at you all the time about graduate regulations are shifting, teaching schedules, grading deadlines, and of course students, and doing your research and writing. So you really need, I think, and when I say you, I mean we publishers really need a drumbeat effect to introduce something different. In short, a memo from the dean really, really won't do it. And in fact, reaching out to deans and department chairs and provosts is not a way to get researchers to understand scholarly publishing and feel invested in it. Instead, it's important to get right down on the ground with them. I think um, there are some reports that kind of substantiate this point. I think the Ithaca Triennial uh, surveys of faculty beliefs and behaviors are really uh, significant and interesting on this. Uh, I was really struck in another study, a Mellon-funded study about uh, creating subventions for humanities monographs at Indiana and Michigan done by the libraries there. One thing that was amazing about that study, uh, a lot of interesting perspectives, but one thing was how few faculty members were willing to participate in the salons that they created to talk about issues of scholarly publishing ecosystems and how humanists need subventions. Despite the traditional incentives of food, they weren't willing to show up. So, at various kinds of gatherings that the institute I run, the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture, among the uh, gatherings that we've hosted and organized, we've aimed at different audiences. So we've aimed at editors of journals, for example. Um, we hosted a summit of journal editors in the field. In humanities, editors tend to be practicing academics um, who have an enormous workload of their own, and they think of their editing work um, outside of the context of scholarly publishing. They think of themselves as you know, just kind of a byproduct labor, but we wanted to bring them into the process. Uh, possibly the most important thing we did was to actually educate our own staff of editors, both in books and in the journal side, um, and give them time to think through some of these issues. And in fact, the editor of our journal has had a post recently on the Scholarly Kitchen. We also targeted leaders of aligned organizations in the field, and then we had seminars specifically for early career scholars, and we took it to them. Um, I have to say, I want to thank David and uh, Rick and also Alice Meadows, who have in fact been troopers about coming on the road, taking these, these kitchen road shows um, for what have been in some cases quite bespoke gatherings of uh, early American historians, but they've really been tremendous and we've made a big impact even with a small group of people, but we've taken it to them. So for example, we did a small seminar at Columbia calling all content providers for early career uh, humanists talking about basic issues. Um, we took that same conference uh, 
that same seminar format to a larger conference, the American Historical Association, which is the largest gathering of historians in the world, several thousand historians at once. Um, we do a resource page. Um, and we've also done something that I think is uh, quite uh, interesting, which I'll talk about in just a second, which is this forensic analysis, which is the last item on my list here. Um, at all of these gatherings, we have kept information bite-sized and really relevant. We shrunk that list of seven things researchers need to know to three basic buckets, business models, licensing, and metrics. These are the three things that as authors and as career academics, they really need to understand. And not only as authors, but also as we have said to them, as they evaluate their colleagues' scholarship, these are things they need to understand, very importantly. So for example, the journal impact factor has absolutely no relevance in the humanities. And when you come up against deans and administrators who are not at humanists, who want to see journal impact factor when they're evaluating humanities faculty for tenure and promotion, and who look for a journal impact factor, and we're confused by it, and I've been called into tenure cases, uh, to write letters and testify to the fact that this is a really absurd way of evaluating humanities faculty. Really excellent scholarship be should be evaluated on the basis of the scholarship itself and not some metric that was designed for another, another purpose. So we've tried to show them that they need this information as authors but also as, um, uh, as ethical uh, colleagues. So uh, we shrunk that list, as I said, to these three. We've tried to appeal to them as authors, but also as colleagues. Many folks have heard of open access, of course, but, but vaguely in the humanities. It's really vague. And they have ideas about f rapacious for-profit publishers. Sadly, they think that all publishers are rapacious for-profit pub for publishers, and it's very helpful to remind them about how very non-nonprofit humanities journal, like mine, with a high level of intensive editing work, goes about turning a manuscript into an article and why it's not free. So one thing we did, this is this last piece I mentioned on this slide, um, is that uh, an author wrote to us after we'd sent a takedown message for a PDF he had posted on academia.edu. We sent a takedown notice. He wrote to me and said, oh, come on. I just want more people to read my work. So we took the opportunity, spent several days, I have to say, of staff time, and did a forensic analysis of how much time it took us um, to s produce that article. And, and then we created a post out of it. Um, and what we found was over 130 hours of specialist labor within the organization. That doesn't count reader reports and other things. That is, we do really intensive, close work. And it costs a lot, actually, to do it. And given that our journal is really incredibly cheap, I'm not even going to tell Tom how much we charge for that journal for the entire University of California system. It's still under $200. Um, <laughs> exactly. So we use that opportunity to really educate not just that author, but also others um, in the field. So in other words, we took our information, our data, and we made it available to them. We got transparent, but we got right down on the ground about it. That single example was worth about 100 pages of explication about our financial model and why a way doesn't fit for the humanities, and in about 1,000 memos from the dean. In sum, staying close to a field lets us know and understand it. To put information in front of researchers within that field in places they're already gathered, as well as places they didn't expect us to be. And I measure the success, at least in part, in this way. Cover your ears, scientists. This is my experiment. My spouse, who is also a historian, was a fellow at the National Humanities Center this past year. And he reported very cheerfully back to me that at an end of the year dinner party with two other historians and a biologist, they had an absolute takedown of open access practices in which the three historians thrashed the biologist. And they felt very informed when they did it. So that's my measure of success. I thank you all very much. Um, okay, so hopefully you have some questions. If you don't, I do. <laughs> I always like to take the moderator's uh, privilege. Um, one question that really occurred to me across all the talks, um, Philippa, you talked very specifically about there's a lot of chaos and a lot of different information. We need to come up with this sort of unified voice. Yet at the same time, Karen talked about you know, there are a lot of differences. We, you know, there are a lot of different organizations out there. We have for-profit, not-for-profit, different size, humanities, social sciences, science. So um, I wanted to sort of ask the panel thoughts about, you know, where is their common ground? Where is there a unified message that we can try to get across? Well, I, I think some of the, some of the message can, is, can 
Can everybody hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, things about the imperatives of um, making underlying data available, and that you just have to do that. And um, things about the importance of the, uh, the concept, if not the actual practice of um, IDs for people so that an individual can be linked to their own work. On the, there are mechanisms as publishers that we put in place that take authors' time and they complain about it a lot. But those mechanisms count. They allow a researcher to get credit for their work, but they cost money. If we could have a unified resource that everyone can draw on to get messages like that across, where the, I, I don't want to say they're no-brainers, but for lack of a better term, they're no-brainers. There are things that I think we could all say we agree upon. So th those are some of my examples. There are lots of variations on the main theme, of course, but there are lots of things that we agree upon. And curation is important. For Could we ask you to um, please talk uh, right into the microphone? Because oh. on the stream, it's very difficult to hear. Okay. Sorry. Um, so does anyone in the audience have a question? Before I m monopolize all the time with all the questions, I want to ask, does anybody have a question? Please step up to the microphone. Um, if not, I can just sort of uh, yell at Tom about what he said about the scholarly kitchen. Um, but I think there was a really important uh, point there um, that Tom made that if you aren't publicly talking about what you do, then Tom is your spokesman. Um, and, and I see a huge amount, and I hear a lot, a huge amount of, of frustration from publishers. I work for a not-for-profit university press. Um, every time I see someone writing something about how horrible scholarly publishers are, it's you guys, uh, you line shareholders' pockets, you make this huge profit margin, this sort of stuff. Well, that's not me, that's not who I am. But if I'm not willing to publicly say this is who I am, then Elsevier is the face of your company. And I think that you know, is, is, is a lesson we need to take to heart of if you, if you have something you want people to know about you, you're the one who's gonna have to say it. Um, there's, um, you know, in, in terms of what you're talking about, the scholarly kitchen, you know, the, one of the struggles that I know I have, and, and we've been really working hard on our comments section, trying not to be mean, um, but there's a natural human um, tendency, everyone who goes on the internet likes to argue with other people and, and start blame wars and things like that. Um, and one of the things I've noticed about Tom's work that I really admire is the humor with which he approaches very, very angry people. It's often very disarming. He can, you know, I think Tom uh, can be a very charming person, and I think it, it goes a long way towards sort of damping down those fires. But I wanted to ask the question about engagement. Um, you know, you don't have to attend every argument to which you're invited, so what are your thoughts about, you know, how does one know when to engage and when to just walk away? Yeah, I mean, one thing that, well, I'll come to that in a second. The, when we talk about engagement, what we found was really interesting. And we were admittedly a little late to the social media game. We found this out during the, uh, the original boycott, you know, um, and, the, and the Research Works Act and all that. Uh, is, you know, we, we issued a statement and we put it like on our website. And, you know, when you think about it, that's, you know, and, or when sometimes companies just put out press releases and they're like, okay, well, you know, that's us talking to the community. But that's one way, it's, that's not talking, that, that's just like kind of just putting out statements, but it, what you really need by en engagement is a two-way conversation. And leave yourself open, and we had lots of conversations when we launched uh, Elsevier Connect, and a lot of people uh, on at Elsevier said, well, you know, or, we don't, you, know, you can't put a comment thread on your articles because people are gonna get in the comments and start yelling back at you. And I was like, well, that's exactly the point. Um, and then, you know, then you kind of get, so th that's the mechanism. And then you kind of talk about like, you know, when do you respond or when do you engage? And you know, th that's all contextual. It, it's all depending on what the issue is, what the answer is, or even what kind of time and resources you have to do that. But, what, but you start it with the premise that it's important. It, you know, and it, it's fundamental that you don't, 
just ignore what people are, are saying or what their concerns are. Or frankly, a lot of times it's not always just concerns, it's when people want to tell you that you're doing uh, things that are good. You know, those are good conversations to have too. And, you know, and you kind of pick up over time. And, and I think what I was like, one of my messages today was, you know, just more people need to be doing it, right? And it's more companies, it's more individuals. Um, it's not always as, uh, as, as scary as it looks. And at the end of the day, even when like, we feel like, or I feel like I've been in a conversation with a, you know, Twitter or if a, if, a, if, a, if a newspaper article came out or something, you know, there are observers in there and you get an opportunity to kind of get your perspective across where pre previously you wouldn't. And at the end of the day, I think, you know, you can't lose when you're doing that. Um, all right, I'll keep, oh, please. Yeah. Well, step to the microphone because there are people we're we're virtually being broadcast throughout the world. Um, I'm Christine Lamb, the director of corporate marketing at um, NEJM Group, and um, my role is to support the brand, uh, the brands, the corporate brand, and the product brands, and um, to also support um, outreach to authors. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about whether marketing can help in that in, in your organizations, what you might do. I think of the, uh, the Library Connect um, blog as a sort of marketing um, arm, uh, but maybe you view it differently. Do others have other experiences with um, rewarding authors? Howard Bachner talked earlier about notes of love to authors every few months to show them the metrics on their articles and other kinds of things that you can do to make them feel warm and fuzzy about you, but also to um, connect to the field. If you're not a subject matter expert and you're not out at conferences dealing with authors, how can you be supported, or how can the home office support some of these activities? Could you talk a little bit about that? And I think of your role, Tom, as sort of dealing with the larger uh, issues in the industry and also the media, which is a little different than the di dealing directly with authors. So. Thanks. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that. Like, that, I had that little reference in there that um, a line about like you know lots of publishers talk to authors and they're very good at it, and and that's important. I like where I was trying to focus it was kind of beyond the authors, right? And and you know when, and that's important too. Especially I also had a reference to you know to taxpayers. You know, again, a lot of people just think, well, we just talk to our communities, but then no, I mean, we have to remember that taxpayers are funding all of this. We have to speak to them as well. The, what you were talking about before is, you know, types of vehicles or channels and, you know, different ways to reach out to, you know, authors. I think the short answer is, you know, is, is, is to do either all of them or as much as you can. Now, a lot of that does become a resource issue, um, you know, and we have, you know, some organizations either focus more on it or prioritize it, uh, but marketing is, we rely a lot on a marketing team, like actually our, our open science team, our open access teams, you know, they're actually even, market, we, we're working basically with their marketing language and they're providing it to us and then we work together on dissemination to various channels. Um, so, I mean, I think the short answer is it's, it's really important and marketing does, like that central coordinating function is, is critical. Yeah, so, so Tom mentioned teams, you know, can, Karen, can you talk a little from the perspective of you're a small self-publishing group. I mean, how do you sort of communicate with the authors and make them feel appreciated and help them understand what they need to know? So uh, I think a predictable answer might be that because we're really small, we have you know only about 30 people who work in the org for the organization um, full time, um, and this is a small humanities field. You might think, well. You know, everybody knows everybody, and we just say, oh, you know, I really understand your work because everyone's a, a kind of a subject matter expert, to, to echo what you said. But that's actually not true. We actually have a director of communications, and part of what we focus on is um, trying to uh, make transparent to everyone who participates, not only the authors, but the readers um, who are doing the readers' reports, the reviewers of books, which we think of as the kind of last chain, uh, last stop in the kind of peer review chain. Everyone focus on both service and values. Possibly there are cynical researchers out there and maybe I just don't know them and maybe I'm just an optimist, but I think researchers, no matter their field, really believe in the importance of what they're doing, that they believe that it leads to something significant 
Um, I know very few, I mean, I know a lot of people who would think that some uh, humanistic scholarship is um, peripheral or not of um, kind of a matter of life and death, but I don't know any humanists who don't believe actually that what they do is incredibly important and incredibly important for taxpayers and for citizenship actually. So values um, I think is really important as well as services to emphasize. We, we try to do that at least within the kind of limited capacity of a small organization focused on one field. Marketing almost by default has value, um, but it has value if that which you are marketing resonates with the recipient. And that's, that's the trick, is to find out how to pick things that are going to seem valuable to the subgroups that you're marketing to. So some may just be a pat on the back, thank you, a, a note of love. Other may be a small tip or tool about how to take the next step and be successful. So I think the, that's the trick in honing that marketing is to give the, the right thanks, the right information, the right tool to the right people at the right time. And the smaller organizations um, have a better sense of pulse and the larger organizations have to gather a lot of data and then use their resources wisely in, in, or, in order to do that. And that's your job and Tom's <laughs> job. Yeah, just a very quick question. Enjoy the presentation and the discussion. It seems to be one common theme is to find the right audience and find the best entry point to connect with them. So I recognize we talk about the subject area is different, and the stage career difference. I was just wondering, especially for Philippa and, and Tom, you travel around the world now, the global communication and the science contributed by the emerging countries. I mean, are this the culture sensitivity, whether that play into your strategy when you try to connect with the researchers in different parts of the world? It, it, it does. I, I mean, we actually, you know, are, are fortunate. We have, you know, people that are local, um, not only publishing experts, but you might say kind of cultural or communication experts. And we do spend some time talking about, like, what is, like, a central corporate message or what is a central marketing campaign, and then how do you, how do you customize it? Um, so I, I, I would agree with you. And then, you know, and, you know, and also, like, and, you know, you have to talk, you have to understand that some groups of researchers are not as far along, you know, in terms of like, you know, we, like, again, like we talk about uh, um, like research ethics or something like, you know, like what's happening in China and India. For the most part, these are emerging um, publishing economies. And you can't talk to them the same way that you would talk to researchers in the UK and in North America. Now, in one way, it's global and everyone reads the same things, but to the extent that you can customize and find ways to to talk to them either, again, either online or in person in a way that's more relatable to them from a cultural perspective, you, you, you do want to do that. But I, I agree with what Tom is saying, and, and in fact, when you were speaking, you were, um, Tom, you were talking about the idea of storytelling. And I think it is, you know, we all know, uh, we can think back probably to our own childhoods and experiences with hearing a story from someone. So to some extent, getting that one-on-one, -on -one, and it, as Tom was saying, different places, different fields, the, the background and the context knowledge can, wa can vary widely. So the storyteller has to figure out what the, what the, ground, the groundwork setting is for giving the information. Thank you. Um, another question? Yeah, and I'm from Authors and Editors, um, and I know full from the Council of Science Editors. Okay. Hey. <laughs> um, I wanted to make a point because I think uh, I haven't seen this point coming up through some of the discussions, especially in communication. Um, ethically, scientific, uh, the scientific method requires publication as the last step. It isn't a peripheral activity that happens because the publication is the embodiment of the piece of knowledge or the, 
or the contribution to the body of knowledge that is going to remain. And I think that's pretty much the same for humanities as well, only the forms are different. So if you think of publication that way, I'm wondering what I try to do as a publisher is to facilitate the education. Um, we do, uh, we've started um, educational uh, programs at the graduate level in the departments where I provide the teaching materials and then I teach the scientists how to read the papers. The problem with teaching how to do STM writing in um, English departments is that they can't read the papers. I mean, they know how to teach writing, they just can't read the scientific content. And so they can't make judgments about the veracity and quality of the science that's being done. So I guess my, my question to you is, don't we have, I mean, there will be, I don't see any end to the need for publishing, but the role of communicating the actual knowledge gain versus um, all of the political support that's required for that, which is where I see advertising going versus where I see the actual preservation of the body of knowledge. I think that is what's deteriorating now with our focus on advertising and media. There's, there's gotta be some way to connect the importance of both of those things. So I like your opinions. So I just, I just wanna chime in on a, on a couple of things. I really do not see publication as the end step. It's a middle step. It's getting a new piece of an argument together and the reason for putting it forth, there are, there are only a very few um, pieces of science that have come out that are like, that's the story. So it really is to foster the debate and to keep the questions coming, so to speak. Um, but I think the idea what you were talking about in writing across the curriculum is the challenge is really getting the scientist to understand the rhetorical structures that they have learned kind of um, in obscura, you know, uh, they, they, they've just absorbed them but don't, see, don't understand the structure of rhetorical argument so they can't overlie that on an article and then teach it to others. So that's where writing across the curriculum where you get someone who has that kind of background and can teach other people how to teach. It's not so much argument as it is, it's not so much writing syntax as it is argument. So I don't know if that. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting point also and in to in contrast with the humanities, you know, in, the, in, in the, the sciences, often the intellectual property, the output, the results are, you know, if I'm looking for a cure for diabetes, the results from my research are going to be the cure, not the paper about the cure. Um, but with the humanities, the end point, the end output is the argument. Can you maybe talk a little about how the understanding of the researcher in the humanities may differ on, and what role it plays? Yeah, no, I think it's an incredibly important point about intellectual property, but also about this notion about the uh, accumulation of knowledge, this very enlightenment principle. The problem is that the enlightenment itself is a very troubling sort of inheritance at this point because we understand better how that notion of a kind of linear accumulation of knowledge is itself the product of particular historical forces which have their own hierarchies um, built in. So. Um, the notion that that we are responsible to sharing knowledge and that publication, in one way, in a traditional sense, you know, published in text, whether it's digital text or, or print text, yes, I think that's absolutely still true, um, and that we're responsible to kind of furthering knowledge. I think that's still true, but the kind of the notion of the kind of accumulation project itself is a little bit um, underweight, I would say. Um, and then to David's point about how for humanists, the, you know, the product itself is the writing, it is the written piece. Um, and of course it's never the end moment because it's not, uh, you know, it's never the last word on the American Revolution. As it turns out, people have had a lot to say about it and will continue to have a lot to say about it because there are new things to say, new interpretations. Um, but one researcher's, you know, argument in one book, that is, you know, that is their, that is their product, that is the product of their research as opposed to finding the cure or the answer 
although who knows that fox news host may have the final word on the revolution we shall see He's recently advertised himself as the best selling historian in america it's sadly true you can just kill me now <laughs> Um, I, I think one other really important point that, that I think Philippa made was um, this idea about publishers being inward facing and we know all the stuff we do, but we've also tried to make everything invisible. You know what, we'll take care of it. Don't, don't worry about it. You don't have to see it. And I, I think we've done ourselves a disservice um, in, in this way of, you know, it gets back to well, what do you do and why is it important? Um, we've kind of hidden these things. And I, I love this study that's still up on the screen that, that, that Karen's group did that said, you know what, here's what happens behind the scenes when we publish an article. Um, so I wanted to ask the group, you know, can we, you know, other thoughts about how we can be more transparent and also I think there's a fear in, you know, I'm someone who was a scientist and came to the business world and it always drives me crazy that there's this automatic sort of knee-jerk reaction of, we have to keep this secret because if Elsevier finds out about what, how much we spend on air conditioning, they'll use this to a business advantage and put us out of business. And, and you know, it's, it, it reaches this ridiculous level where we won't even, you know, anonymously share a certain information as, you know, as an industry to, to come up with some baseline. And how do we get past that, that, that knee-jerk fear and realize that it's kind of stupid? <laughs> well, well, one of the things I'm I wanted to make the point of, as you said, like, you know, that we do more that people don't see to publish an article. One of the things I try to talk more about is that it's not just about the one article. And, and I can totally understand sometimes, like if you're an author and you submit a manuscript, a manuscript and maybe it's a, you know, in the social sciences area and, and then you, you know, and then you look at it in the journal and it doesn't look a whole lot different from the, th from the version you submitted. You go, well, okay, well, what do publishers do? That, so that's like the one article and I don't discount that that may not happen every once in a while. But, you know, I mean, elsewhere alone, we publish 400,000 articles a year. I mean, we're, our database is 10 million articles, and the, the 400,000 that are published, how many versions of that went online? The, the scale of what we work with is, is almost unfathomable. And so people, you know, like, I just kind of remind people that it's not always about what we did for the one article. It's what have we done as a community for the millions of articles? And the ones that, that's, I mean, of course, then the other one you like, you like mentioning a lot is the millions of articles that aren't published. <laughs> so I, I think one of the things to do is remind people of the scale at which we all operate. You know, one of the things that we've all talked about is getting the, the younger members, the, the employees working in these organizations, large and small, more involved, more engaged in the discussions, um, but also that the high level leadership, to address your question, at some point, one would hope, would make a decision that information will be shared. And that has to come from the, from the highest levels of leadership, and there just has to be a commitment to do that. And there are efforts, like the top guidelines, that, um, you know, Marsha McNutt, who's now at the Academy has really pressed for those things. And there's a lot of engagement across the industry to, the, the guidelines are there, but not, they're not being quite, you know, uh, engaged and, and uh, the talents put in them yet. But they're there and that's a first step. So things of that nature, I think are incredibly important. Uh, Jacob has a question from the uh, virtual audience. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. perfect. Uh, this question is from uh, Kim Powell from uh, Emory University. Uh, Kim writes, one of the areas I didn't hear mentioned was engaging with librarians. Uh, I know most academic librarians are very interested in supporting author and researchers um, and uh, educating them about publishing. Do any of the speakers have uh, particularly uh, success stories about engaging with libraries? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, well, if you, if you, you know, look at that circle that I have, there's one node in it that says publarian, which is that, that publisher librarian, that role that li libraries play in interfacing with publishers. And there are, uh, uh, AAAS, we have gone out and spoken at s science libraries where they bring together the authors and then get research librarians and authors and publishers together
to kind of open up the face of the watch and, and have an open forum. So that, uh, that there are certainly, uh, in my experience, some, some efforts doing that. I don't. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, the answer is absolutely we work with librarians and partner with them on a variety of ways that we have, uh, we have newsletters, I think someone mentioned, and then there's a lot of um, workshops that will come on campus for. I think it's important, right? I mean, like they're, they're the critical liaison between the, you know, the publishing community and the researchers themselves. Um, so whoever, I mean, whoever asked that question, I think the answer is absolutely. I mean, we, you can't talk enough about how uh, critical librarians are to the, to the process and particularly, again, educating researchers about what resources are available to them. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'd add, I, I think there's, a, there's an emphasis, there's probably more of a sales emphasis in our interactions with the librarians. We have these sales teams, we have uh, marketing, in, institutional marketing teams, but we probably don't do the sort of communication the way we are reaching out to the research community, and I, I'd like to see more. Um, you know, I mean, I've given talks at the ALA and things like that, but I think that's the little, little one-off efforts. And I, I, I one of the things I've been working on is putting together educational either webinars or going in person. So we, we're uh, a primarily a society publisher. We publish uh, 400 journals. I think around 70% of those are owned by research societies or research institutions. And so to me, this is this perfect in to the research community and, and trying to put together programs. You know, you start with the editors of those journals who are working researchers in the field who then have a very decent sphere of influence and then every society or even if you have a journal that's not with a society it's probably tied to some big meeting and setting up sessions at those meetings as we did with the American Historical Association and just getting uh, you know people in front of the researchers that way but also trying to drive that in the direction of the library community as well and setting up sessions at library meetings and and putting together uh, groups of librarians to to receive that information or you know if you do it as a webinar making that available to your library community as well as your um, uh, uh, your researcher community. David uh, also uh, I'm John Tagler with the AAP uh, most large publishers and not just the uh, commercial publishers but most societies that have uh, sizable uh, program publishing programs um, have library advisory boards in fact uh, when I went to AAP about nine years ago, one of my thoughts was, well, let's set up a, an industry-wide library advisory board. And what I found out was that most of the members that would be active already have these. So there's a, and they've been, you know, they've been around for many, many years. So that's another really strong channel of communica communication where they can get g good and um, substantial feedback. But I think also using that channel to go more broadly into the library community. If you've got this, uh, this group put together, 